Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Realignment. First off, I want to thank you all and welcome you all to this channel. We have seen a thousands of new subscribers uh, in the last week. I can wonder why. And for that reason, we actually just want to take a little time and we want to reintroduce the show to all of you, both for today's interview and just so you know what you're sticking around for. What was so amazing about this is we had around 16,000 subscribers to the YouTube channel. We'd always joke, hey, we do video. We're not video first, though. We have these kind of sketchy, janky <laughs> title cards. But now, as of this recording, we're at 42,000. We're going to easily hit 50 by the end of the week. So we technically, Sagar, are now a probably YouTube audio equal podcast. Welcome so to the thank game. Thank you so much Welcome for to the game. coming, everyone. Yeah. And we're going to definitely keep stepping it up. So for all of that reason, especially all of you new people, we wanted to take a second to reintroduce the podcast, the realignment, and give you some context on today's interview. Yeah, so look, we do two shows a week. They are Tuesdays and Thursdays. They have audio versions too, wherever you guys get your podcast video out version, obviously right here on YouTube. Make sure that you also subscribe to the podcast as well though, just so that you don't miss out on any episodes, but also we do intros. So we'll have like listener questions, things like that. So if you wanna do Q&A, you can get all of that on the listener version, the audio version of that. We have a community that we wanna build and that's where we like to hear from you. And the key thing is, as you're looking at breaking points, you're looking at Crystal Kyle, what is the realignment as a podcast? We definitely started in DC where we were focused on how is DC changing during the Trump presidency, especially on the right. But what's happened over time as rising and now breaking points has really grown is we've found that there's this huge audience of people who are just desperate to understand how the world works right now as the country and the world realigns. So we do yeah. episodes on WeWork, we do episodes on startups, episode on foreign policy. It's basically covering everything. And if the Breaking Point show is your daily news fix, what we're going to build this into is a channel where you just want to understand how our systems actually work so that you can do something about them. Yeah, that's right. And look, we got a realignment Substack that's available in the show notes. We've got a bookshop where you can buy any book that you want, but also all the books that we recommend and the books of all of our guests. We have awesome book shows all the time. And it's a great way to support an independent bookstore. Helps our work here at the podcast as well. For the most dedicated fans, you can buy a mug at realign the realignment.fm. Again, I'm bombarding you. It's all going to be down in the show notes. So don't worry about it. And look, as you guys know, uh, this is the week I'm launching breaking points with my co-host Chris. So we've been really, really busy. We've been overwhelmed uh, by your response to the launch and all of that. But Marshall's actually helping me out. He stepped in. He covered this interview all on his own, which he has today. And I want to make sure, though, that I stopped here and I could come say hi to all of you because I missed you, frankly. Yeah, quick behind the kimono moment. I called Sagar at 6 p.m. on Sunday, and he was the most exhausted I'd ever heard of myself. <laughs> Hey man, I've got some news. Uh, you don't have to interview on Tuesday. And <laughs> see, I wish I could see his yeah. face as he just saw that his Monday oh, afternoon opened God. up to not All have right. to record an interview. So thank you for tuning in, everyone. We will be doing this 99.9% .9 of the time together from now on. Yeah, that's but right. All this great stuff. With all that said, if you haven't already subscribed to the YouTube, definitely go press subscribe below above it's up here. I'm, it's up here, I'm getting man. I'm getting I, see, I am new way. to this I'm pointing the yeah. wrong direction right to there. the side and most importantly check out the actual podcast itself we have over 130 different episodes that you can go back and check great episodes with Eric Weinstein Scott Galloway Joe Scarborough Kyle Kalinsky yes we did it it will probably trigger <laughs> you but a lot of really great stuff but let's get to the interview Catherine Gale, welcome to The Realignment. Marshall, I am thrilled to be here this morning. I was incredibly excited once I read your book, watched your TED Talk, which we'll link to in the show notes, of course, because you expressed both a feeling and then pushed back against a lot of conventional wisdom that a lot of people who have that feeling have. So I want to start there. You've written about how you feel politically homeless in this moment, which tends to be something that leads people to be interested in political innovation reform in the first place. So let's just start with your feeling on that. Yeah, I, I actually didn't invent that term politically homeless. I can't remember where I heard it, but it resonated for me immediately the same way I feel it does for so many when I now say it. Uh, and I'm really 
politically homeless for two primary reasons. One is a policy reason, which is to say that I don't find that of the two choices, that there is some platform that resonates with me on every issue. But mostly because on both sides, they oversimplify everything in policy, which is to say no one on either side wants to admit that there are trade-offs in policy, which is that you can't have everything you want without paying for it. For example, that is a trade-off, so we have to deal with that. You can't, um, you can't have your own way without taking into account what other people in the country want. So I feel that our policy discussion is devoid and separate from real life and how we really need to solve complex problems. Then the second reason that, and this might even be in some ways more powerful why I feel politically homeless is really a cultural reason, which is that as a business person, and even just as a person functioning in the world, in my job, and, and like so many of your listeners in their jobs, we have to worry about results. We can't just say to our companies, well, I, I'm for more revenue. We actually have to deliver more revenue. We can't say we're for, we're pro customer satisfaction if our customers don't end up being satisfied. And yet our culture and politics now allows the people, you know, our elected officials and, and people in campaigns to say, this is what I'm for. And then it allows them to keep getting reelected, being for those things, whether or not they've ever actually delivered those things. And for me to, to sort of see this construct where there's no connection with whether results have been delivered or not makes me feel um, you know, disconnected from that, meaning I don't want to be a part of that. And instead of delivering results, what the culture is in politics right now is just a culture of blaming the other side. Like I'm for customer satisfaction, I'm for revenue, and it's the fault of the other people that we didn't get that. So it's this zero sum game. And when you combine the fact that we uh, don't deal powerfully with complex problems and policy and we don't have a culture that focuses on results and what we have to do to get there, and it's just a zero sum culture, then that leaves me not wanting to associate, not feeling called to either of our two choices right now. And what I love about the way you just set that up is that a lot of people will listen to your articulation of that and then conclude okay, the problem that Catherine's identifying is that Washington, the system, the establishment, pick your watchword, is broken. But as we're getting into the theory of what you're actually describing, then what you're actually proposing is a solution, your point is actually counterintuitively, no, like this, nothing's actually broken here, it's working. Can you expand on that? Yeah, this is a really important insight, which I originally received as what I consider a gift from a former Republican Congressman, Mickey Edwards, who, who really uh, gave me the light bulb moment of understanding that what we have is a systems problem. So to your question, is Washington broken? No, it's not. It's doing exactly what it's designed to do. Now, why do we think it's broken is because we, as citizens of the United States of America, the country that invented modern democracy, have assumed, and I think sort of rationally assumed, that our political system must have been designed to deliver results in the public interest, to sort of respond to what is needed by citizens to move the country forward. But it turns out that when we look under the hood in the politics system, we discover that actually the design post the Constitution, okay, so the Constitution did that. It was designed to figure out how to have a democracy that responds to you know, citizens and moves the country forward, et cetera. But post that, there are a lot of other rules and norms and practices that have been developed in our system over time and those have actually been, for the most part, created 
and or optimized by and for the people in the business of politics. So the people making their money, having their jobs associated with that industry. I actually call it the political industrial complex. And your listeners will know this right away. If we think about it, even if we don't know the numbers of revenue, for example, we know, oh my goodness, the business of politics is doing better than ever, right? Think about it. There's more money in campaigns. There's more money in fundraising. There's more money in commercials. There's more power than ever. And so the business of politics is doing great, even as the customers of that business, if we think of it that way, which is to say the citizens, the public interest, have never been more dissatisfied. So the design is working for those who designed it post the constitution, which is the business of politics. But if Washington is broken, if what we want is a system that's designed to move the country forward. So it's just another way of looking at it. And it invites us to say, oh, well, what's wrong in that design that's creating a situation where those in the business are doing great and the customers of that business, again, the citizens, public interest, aren't doing great at all. And that's a design problem. And that's where politics industry theory comes in. Yeah. And before we get to the theory and the discussion over the rules that should change, why is now different, right? So your whole point is post-constitution. There have been all these examples of periods in our history that were, frankly, way worse. So the 1850s, obviously way worse than now on 15 different levels. The 1960s, from a political violence perspective, the DNC riots in 1968, the you know 70s, we can make a joke about gas lines being a thing now too, but there, there have all these problems in the 70s, right? So why... Is there this specific moment today where you think the rules constituting themselves are causing this problem? Because to add one quick thing to that, the obvious point here is that we did move we moved past the 1850s with the Civil Wars. So that wasn't the right way to do it, but um, worth it, but obviously not the ideal way to get through something. We got past the 60s. We got past the 70s. Why are we not just going to get past this moment where the rules are still going to work? Yes. So... Super important. Everything is complex. So the moment that we're in right now and the the fact that it feels somewhat existential to the question of whether democracy is going to, you know, be the best way for us to live together. um, The re that's that question comes because of multiple factors coming together at the same time. And so simply put, I will say, there is a context that happens in each of these historical periods when we as a country confront some of the limits and challenges of how of how hard it is to figure out how to live together. And that context exists and creates oftentimes some of the crisis around it. The question, and so for example, if there weren't some contextual things going on, like globalization um, and some other economic factors, et cetera, maybe we wouldn't be having the crisis right now. But what I focus on is not those contextual factors, but whether the rules of the way we run our politics allows us to deal powerfully with the challenges that we're naturally confronted with in sort of being, you know, human beings living out our, our lives here. And so, The rules, um, why are they working less well? Well, let's go to private industry again. If you, um, if regulators go into an industry and they say, every piece of equipment in this industry over 50 pounds is subject to a 50% tax. Well, everything that can possibly be 49.9 pounds is going to become 49.9 pounds instead of 51 pounds as fast as possible because there's a big you know, opportunity there. That's just one example to say that over time, players in any industry optimize around the rules of the game. 
and they figure out how to take them to their limits and they push the envelope on them and they change the rules wherever they can to benefit um, their interests. And so one of the things we haven't done in American politics is look very much at the rules. We look at the players, we say, the, the question is who wins? Then the problem is who wins or the solution is who wins? And then we also know we have this constitution, but all that stuff in the middle, we're paying no attention to. And the degradation of those rules, in a sense, the regulation of politics has now been optimized in a way over time that gets us to this really um, negative point. So some of the rules haven't changed, but the way the players are pushing the envelope on them is much worse for our outcomes than it was 10 years ago. It's a, it's a downward slope. Um, behavior that was not accepted 10 years ago is accepted now. And we keep stair-stepping our way down uh, using these rules always in a in a way that hurts our ability to get things done in Congress more than it helps. And you know, I'm realizing as you, because we're getting to the rules section next, thinking of those really big conflagration moments. So whether it's the civil rights era, there was a rule change there. It's, you know, it's the Civil Rights Act. If you look at the New Deal, that was the definition of a rule change. So it wasn't just the Civil War that gets you to the 1850s moment. It's the Emancipation Proclamation and like reforming the Constitution, abolishing the, you know, second bank under Andrew Jackson. So I'm just thinking the point then is like in these moments, it wasn't just that there was this terrible moment that the country just moved through. There had to be systemic changes that actually address the underlying issue. So I, I'm, I'm convincing myself um, of your point as you're just giving and, that response. And reconvincing me, which, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's right. And so the crisis becomes something that we have a responsibility to use as an opportunity. The crisis is what must force us to look at the rules and say what should be changed, either by a new policy or in this case, sort of the rules of the regulation of how people try to figure out how to solve our problems together or currently don't try to figure out together how to solve our problems. Yeah. So then before we get into your specific solution, I'm sure in the audience's mind, there are a couple solutions, rule changes that should be taken. So for example, gerrymandering. The Electoral College, so the popular vote debate, term limits, money in politics. It's not that you're dismissive of those things, but I think if I'm interpreting your TED Talk the right way, your argument is that changing those things would be marginal and wouldn't actually address the systemic change you're trying to make. Can you just articulate why that is? Yes, and I'll I'll tell you a little story. I I sometimes describe it to people this way. I look, I, I think this is an extraordinary country, by the way. So I'm talking about certain negative things. But by the way, I think we are the best possibility for democracy, you know, here in America. And I see lots of phenomenal things about this country that are going to able enable us to get on the right track. OK, but now let me move back to, um, you know, this honest assessment of where we're at, which is I would say that you can think of it as we're drowning. And some things that people would like to do are, are good. They're well-intentioned. Um, and they would, let's say, lower the water over our heads. But if we drown in two feet or two inches, we are still dead. So the only thing that satisfies my desire to be focused on results are changes that would actually lower the water to at least right below our noses, which is to say we need to just live. So what I mean by that is we have to find um, solutions that are powerful enough to ch change the likelihood that Congress starts to solve problems in the public interest. And then we also have to find solutions that we can achieve. We can't we can't. I say, I don't recommend that we spend our time talking about things that if they were different, it would be so helpful if there's no way to make them different. Mm -hmm. If there's no lever over which we have control, 
then we're just hoping with no path to, you know, action. So point being two conditions. What we focus on should be powerful, change the likelihood Congress delivers outcomes. And then the second thing, this has to be achievable. So the four things you mentioned, gerrymandering, electoral college, term limits, and uh, money in politics, you know, those things are mostly not achievable. Term limits for Congress take a constitutional amendment. Changing the electoral college takes a constitutional amendment. Money in politics in some of the most substantive ways takes a constitutional amendment. Gerrymandering has been found constitutional, you know, by the Supreme Court. States can still make some changes, but because it's been so partisanized, it's going to be a partisan fight everywhere. So the achievability of those things isn't there for us. But the second thing is that they're also not nearly as powerful as people think, because here's where we, we, I think, make a mistake sometimes. We look at reforms that might change who wins, and we think that could help us. But what we really need to do is say, would this reform, would this innovation change what the winners have the freedom to do? Which is to say, if we change who wins, like let's take term limits. Mm -hmm. If we change who wins, but we don't change what the winners have the freedom to do and are incented to do, we just have a different face playing the same game and delivering the same kinds of results. So what my work focuses on is what would we have to change so that whoever the winners are, their incentives are to deliver policy solutions that respond to the general electorate and, and, that, and that they're incented to work with the other side to get some sustainability and they're incented to get rid of gridlock and they're not captive to their extremes on both sides. And so that's what Again, my work is focused on, it's about outcomes. It's not about changing who wins. It's about changing what the winners are incented to do. Yeah. And just a quick comment. What I love about the way you're articulating this is it also explains why there's a negative feedback loop. So whenever you do see what will change is within those four categories, so the gerrymandering, electoral college, term limits, money in politics, and money in politics especially, whenever you see something happen, but then the broader system doesn't change that weirdly actually feeds cynicism. So we have a decent number of, let's say, um, AOC Democrats who listen to the show. And a weird niche thing that most people probably don't see happen is there are a lot of justice Democrats types who are very mad at AOC because they say, what, like, you, you know, you're crowdfunded, you ran against a long-term establishment incumbent, but you're coming into Congress and nothing's actually changing. You're working with Nancy Pelosi, you're doing this, this, and that, which then feeds like a deeper degree of cynicism. So it's just an example of how, and you don't have to agree with this, but I'm just realizing as you're saying this to a certain degree, when you pursue these systemic, these changes, and they don't actually deliver the broad sweeping change that one would think they would, it could actually lead to a process which further harms reform and leads to more disengagement. I think that's totally true. I think it's like we're holding a carrot out in front of people. There, you know, those of us, and I'll sort of mea culpa for people in this industry of systems change. Oh, this will fix it. This will fix it. This will fix it. And then we keep moving what will fix it. And then we have to donate to another not-for-profit or support <laughs> a new candidate. Or this is the most important election. No, this is the most important election. And it really doesn't change. I mean, people are marginally happier if, quote, their side is in control. But if they look at the results and also if they look at the likelihood that, you know, we have some sustainability, even if they're results they like, it, it isn't working. Any of these things, which is yeah. why it's all about incentives. What, you know, what freedom does any president have? Well, they need Congress to give them you know, good bills to sign, for example. Um, what freedom does any particular member of Congress have to work with the other side or to solve problems? They don't. And that's why we're seeing more um, kind of celebrity action in Congress, because we can't really get 
that much done anyway. So the most opportunity is to become in some ways a celebrity and keep raising money and you get more power, but that power is divorced from results. Yeah. Is that divorced from the results of helping others win or getting more money? It's divorced from public policy results. And that's the part which also leads to your point about like the politics industry as an actual as a thing, the industrial complex too, because what you see happen is in a system where nothing gets done or it feels, because once again, we're not claiming that nothing is getting done. What we're saying, I think, is that there are some deep structural issues that if you're looking at the polling, if you're looking at the clear incentive systems should be addressed. Those are not getting addressed, right? You're obviously still passing um, COVID stimulus checks. Like there are issues that are just so pressing that it could break through that specific issue. But I don't think anyone would argue that the COVID stimulus checks passing dialed down the heat in the country right now. No, so, and also, yeah. if I could, Marshall, Please. one of the few times when we quote break through, you know, and get something done is when we decide to pass the bill on to future generations. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a statement over whether X stimulus bill or COVID relief bill was worth the money. But what I'm saying is that when we pass big things, we never pay for them. There is no party of fiscal responsibility anymore. Some of those things we may have needed to do, but we can't have needed to do all of it over the past 10 years, you know, and, and not ever say, hmm, this has a cost to it. And basically a lot of times the two parties come together and they say, okay, let's finally agree on this budget, you know, to avoid this government shutdown. So quote, our side will get what we want. You guys will get what you want. And neither of us will tell about the fact that we put it on the credit card. That's so interesting because what you're helping me realize, because like, I'm, I'm not that much of a, I'm more Stephanie Caltini. I don't, um, oh. I'm not, part, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not, not literally aesthetically, not, I'm not literally an MMT person. Um, but I agree with what you're saying because what it seems like you're saying within like the competitive framework here is that deficit spending enables you to not have trade-offs in the moment. So when there's an issue where there are trade-offs, that's where you're going to see the gridlock. That's where you're going to see not things get done. But there are just cases where that could actually happen where you can just push the bill forward. Therefore, there's less of a cost to it. Um, I, I think you've done an amazing job of actually defining the system. And we don't want to just leave things here so people feel cynical. What should one actually do about this then? What are the rule changes that you would propose to address this? And and, and just a quick thing to know, and you, you mentioned this in the book, and it, is worth noting. You're speaking specifically in like a congressional national capacity, right? So this isn't quite about like state and local politics. Like it's kind of related. It's kind of not, but like, that's the context that we're speaking in. Correct. Yeah. Again, look, I want to do things that are powerful enough to change results, but I also don't want to let perfect be the enemy of the good. We're not taking on every single problem that people might think we have at one time. So the focus is squarely on Congress. It's not right now in the presidency. It's not right now in state legislatures. So here's what I'll say. I've been demonizing in a sense, quote, the business of politics. I have no problem with the business of politics. I'm actually a huge free markets person. I think that free markets and competition, healthy competition, well-regulated competition, in sense, innovation results in accountability. So what we need to do is figure out how do we make it so that it is so that what causes the people in the business of politics to do well, which is say to get reelected, is the same as what makes the customers of that business happy, mm -hmm. right? Instead of now those are two different things. So if we make those the same, that's how basically incentives work the best, which is when I was running my company, uh, my company did the best if my customers were doing well. And also, by the way, if my suppliers did well, et cetera. So you create sort of some holistic um, industry where there's some win-win capability in the entire industry. And right now, that's not what happens in politics. So what we do is we look then at the rules and we say, where is the real bottleneck that creates that disconnect? And we find two things. One, 
we have party primaries, and two, we have something called plurality voting. And I'm going to quickly say what these two problems do. First, party primaries, where you vote in the Democrat primary or the Republican primary, are the biggest structural problem we have, which is to say they push both sides so far apart that they are essentially forbidden to work together. They are forbidden to compromise, to reach consensus, because if they do, they can't win re-election. In 80% of House races, over 80% of races for the House, the elections are decided in the party primary. So for example, in a Republican district, almost all of the time, we know that whoever wins the Republican primary is absolutely for sure gonna win in November. And we know that in blue districts, whoever wins the Democrat primary is gonna for sure win in November, which means that the, the November elections, when we all show up in the democracy, are meaningless for what they're incented to do and for who they're answering to. And only 10% of people really vote in primaries, which means that our party primaries have made 10% of people the boss of us, the boss of our representatives and the boss, therefore, of everything that's happening, more than money in politics in that sense. And the challenge is not that there's anything wrong with these 10% of people. I vote in primaries, you know? <laughs> the point is that they're the only ones having a say, and they tend to be, voters in primaries tend to be more ideological than voters as a whole and more single issue. And so they separate us far more than we really are separated. And they have stricter um, opinions about what would be acceptable, which is why primary has gone from being just a noun as in the primary to being a verb as in two primary, which we hear this all the time now. AOC is quote, threatening to primary Chuck Schumer which means that Chuck Schumer has to look over his shoulder and say, who's going to put pressure on me for not being as far to the left as I need to be and beat me in my primary? Um, Trump is using the primary to threaten uh, Republicans that aren't you know, loyal enough to him. And so they have to look over their shoulder and say, who's going to take me out in my primary? And that basically guarantees that nobody can afford to work together on either side and come to a consensus and vote yes on that bill because they know they'll lose their next election. And unless we get rid of that problem of party primaries, there's a, we're not gonna be able to do anything. It's like, if you fixed all those things we said you know before, if you fixed a, if you, let's say there was a highway running down the entire country, like straight across east to west, and you have the most spectacular highway system on the east and on the west, and then right in the middle, it came down to one lane going each way. How many cars could you get through that? You would be limited by that tiny one mile section of one lane. That's what party primaries are doing to our system. There is nothing else that is going to help us if we leave that intact. Yeah. Second so, piece. Oh, go so, ahead. So, so, so two, two questions that um, come to mind because... I'm not quite sure how I feel about both of them. So I'll be a little half, I think this half of my devil's advocate. One, what do you just say to that 10% of people who are going to say, Catherine, we're not going to apologize for being engaged in the system. So people who in that 90%, they are choosing not to be engaged. Uh, obviously there's a discussion around voting rights and ballot access, but like, let's be real. Like most people have the ability to completely uncontestedly vote. So that 90%, they're making a choice. They are making a choice and that should be a thing. Um, and two, like this is a private membership organization. This is the Republican Party. This is the Democratic Party. And it's completely within our rights, just as a union would say, we want to have our members determine our thing. Why doesn't that apply? Like, so what are your responses to, to that, those arguments? My response is that those arguments are great and correct. Here's, here's what I'll say, though. I, I think it's amazing that people vote in primaries and that they're engaged and that they get involved and they advocate for their issues. And, and I, by the way, don't want some squishy middle. I support 
ideological diversity. I think innovation often arises from what are at the times considered extremes. Okay, we don't want to just split the difference on all of our issues as if that's somehow optimal. What we want, though, is that we don't want those 10% of people to have so much more weight than everybody who is also very engaged by showing up at the general election. We have told people that the general election is where the decision is made. So therefore we should make that so, which is the general election is where you really get to choose. And yes, which means that in my, in my solution that I'll talk about, we're not taking power away from people you know, to vote in primaries. What we're saying is we're gonna make sure the general election is where the final decision is made. Okay, so, so we just don't want the final decision to be the primary and be pretending that the final decision is the general. That's goofy and unfair to all those people showing up. Now, the second thing is, yes, these, par these political parties are private organizations. They should get to choose their own candidates. Actually, I support political parties choosing their own candidates and not needing to take, quote unquote, what the primary voters decide. They can be private organizations and decide who they want to run, and they'll be incented to run someone that's acceptable you know, to their voters. But um, the current situation is in that in about half the states, there are whole groups of people who, because they're not registered in a party, can't participate in the election that's making the decision about who's going to represent them. So we have to separate the selection process for a private organization from a public election process that controls who the voters have to choose from in November. Because right now those parties control, only one Democrat can be chosen in November, only one Republican can be there in November. And we have to eliminate the party's ability to, you know, to control that and their need to take that choice you know, from the public. They can decide on their own. So I say that this system addresses uh, those concerns that you, that the system I propose addresses both of those concerns. And, and a quick, um, you obviously know the landscape of the states better than I do, but didn't, haven't states like California experimented with changing the primary system to a certain degree? What 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 has been the effect of those changes so far? This is the whole laboratories of democracy argument, obviously. Yeah. So the solution that I'll talk about in a little bit requires it's called final side voting. It requires two changes. We have to get rid of party primaries and then we have to change um, how we vote in the general election. Some states in the country have experimented with half of those things, which is to say some states have tried to get rid of party primaries. Some states have tried to move to what I call instant runoff voting, which is the other half of the, of the combination solution I proposed. But no states until November of 2020 have tried the package. Mm -hmm. And so the laboratories of democracy have really been helpful in figuring out what the optimal design solution is that we recommend now, because we've seen the limits of some of the things that have been tried in isolation, meaning not the combination. And, um, but now we need to try, now we need laboratories of democracy for the combination. Uh, this combination of final five voting. And that's what passed in Alaska in November of 2020. So, but to be a bit more specific, you asked about California. So California did one half, which is they said, let's not have party primaries. We'll just have a primary, everybody runs and the top two vote getters advance. What we learned from that is that the top two is still not enough healthy competition to alter the incentives that are driving the behavior of people for outcomes. So sometimes, again, I'll say sometimes in California, their new system changes who wins. It has not changed what the winners are incented to do and have the freedom to do. And it hasn't made them responsible to their entire district, which is to say that 
Republicans in California are pretty much as disenfranchised as they were before that change. That's a really yeah. good way of putting it. Yeah. So let's get to pl- oh, oh sorry, sorry. Yeah. no yeah I just want to get to um, yeah. plurality vote because that because once again we're covering one half of it yeah. plurality voting in the general election in November is the next is the next issue it needs to be addressed by the final by the solution here correct right so let me back up for a moment let's think about again the industry in any other and again remember I believe that competition is a motivator for innovation and improvement, you know, in in every endeavor. Okay, again, well-regulated competition, but nonetheless competition. And so um, in any other industry, as large and as thriving as the politics industry, where there's only two competitors and enormous customer dissatisfaction, which is to say that you know maybe 90% of people don't approve of Congress, what would happen? Well, what would happen in any other industry is you would have an entrepreneur who would look at that industry and say, oh my goodness, that is an extraordinary business opportunity. I'm gonna get in there and create a new competitor responding to what the customers want because I'll be able to you know, have a great business. But that never happens in politics. The current two are guaranteed to remain the only two, regardless of what they do or don't get done on behalf of their supposed customers. And that's because of how we vote. So historically, when we created the country, there really weren't other democracies to look to. So we had to decide how to actually run elections and we copied from countryside elections in Britain where they had said, oh, when we elect these representatives, how we'll choose who wins is we'll say whoever has the most votes wins. And you know what, that seems super logical. Of course, whoever has the most votes should win. But it turns out that's actually a real problem because in any election of more than two candidates, someone could win with less than majority support. For example, with three candidates, someone could win with uh, 34% of the vote because the other two candidates could get 33% each, meaning 66% of the people didn't want that winner. And And that doesn't seem to work. And to work, no, this is always the argument against third parties as spoilers. Um, in that dynamic, like that that dynamic right there, because once again, I, I don't endorse third parties um, in that context, because that's a really legitimate, really important argument, um, which really does matter. Um, so yeah, again, that's just like an important, like that's an important opera- operationalization of the na- dynamic you're describing. Yes, you're totally right. Some people think, oh, that doesn't sort of seem fair, but that's not the problem. The problem is what you just said. It creates the spoiler effect which means that anybody who would like to be a third party or an independent candidate is essentially said, told by the system, oh, you can't do that because the only thing, you'll never win. You'll actually just take enough votes away from the candidate you're most similar to to accidentally hand the election to the candidate that you like the least. So like if you go back to 2016 presidential, voters were told, oh, If you like libertarian candidate Gary Johnson, you know, great for you, but don't actually vote for the guy because all he's going to do is take votes away from Donald Trump and accidentally give the election to Hillary. And voters on the left who like Green Party candidate Jill Stein were said, you know, good, I'm glad you like her, but don't, even though this is a democracy, don't actually vote for her because you'll just, you know, spoil the race for Hillary. And I'm not actually a person who says if we had more parties, things would be better. No. I'm I'm saying that what we need is competition where there's the threat of new competition that pushes the current competitors to serve their customers, to solve problems on behalf of their customers, which is to say, and I, I said this a moment ago, I don't have any problem with our current parties per se, or the fact that there are only two, it is the fact that they're guaranteed to be the only two, regardless of what they do or don't get done. So I'm not saying if we had a third, things would be better. I'm saying if they believed that if they didn't start getting things done, they could lose their position to someone else, they would start getting things done that made more people happy. 
Yeah, and a quick thing I need to pull out because this could be a little confusing and it was addressed really well in the book, which is your point is not that when you're talking about competition and markets, your argument is not, I'm a businesswoman, we need to run government like a business. What you are saying is that if we look at the structure of our political system, there is a problem where there's just no incentive for competition and you need you need competition um, in, in a market with those two parties. So your argument is actually if there was more competition, you would see those two parties actually behave much more rationally from an accomplishing things, addressing people's concerns perspective. Is that is that a correct reading? Yes, of what you're saying? you are exactly right. I definitely do not think that government should be run like a business. I think our political system um, exists right now in under sort of the same incentives that all human endeavor, you know, exists in. Um, and that incentives matter. And right now they're incented, they get to do well without serving their customers and competition uh, to take their place, shall we say, would incent them to do well by serving their customers. So I, I, um, I think it's pretty exciting opportunity actually for the parties to be able to match up what it takes for them to be successful with what it takes for them to do what they actually know behind closed doors we need to get done. What do they, so this is an interesting question because I've been engaged in the system. What do you think the parties know that they don't, that they're just choosing not to do? Oh, so if you talk to people um, as I have, like in a, let me say a different way. Sometimes I talk to people who have served in the Obama administration. Sometimes I talk to people who have served in the Bush administration or any other administration. And one of the questions I say to them is when when you think about, you know, what I'm proposing to you, I'd like you to ask yourself the question, what could have been if while I this person I'm talking to was serving in the Bush administration or was serving in the Obama administration was working with a Congress that was elected under these incentives. And what we end up finding is that these people, and unfortunately I can't share the exact stories, but they will say, Oh yeah, I was in a meeting and you know, I'm from uh, the Obama administration. We were in a meeting with the Republicans and said, Oh, well we support these parts and these parts and these parts, but we can't vote for it because we'll lose our primaries. And so they they can't support it, and therefore it the legislation tends to move further to just giving Democrats everything they want, and and then the same happens on in Republican administrations where Democrats say behind closed doors, yeah, I basically think we need to do this kind of thing. I would like a few little changes, but I'm not going to support you anyway because I won't win my primary. So instead, we do you know a package of things again that are further to the right and to the left. So. A specific example is that the broad outlines of immigration reform have been the same over the past two decades. And there is no political will on either side to make the trade-offs that need to be made to come to the consensus solution, which would not be perfect. Because let me say, if there were a perfect solution to our big problems like healthcare, immigration, um, you know, fiscal issues, even our crummy system would have solved them. Thank you for, okay, so thank you for, not to interrupt you, but thank you for saying that because in the back of my mind, I was sort of thinking, come on, Catherine, if there was a solution to the abortion debate or to X, Y, Z, and Z thing, it would be out there, right? Because there, but, but your point is, and once again, this is why we're going back to where you started, politics, policy, it's complex. In these complex issues, and actually this goes, by the way, takes us back to the COVID checks thing. That's actually pretty simple. It's, hey, the economy is shut down. People need money. We're just going to expand unemployment and we're going to send checks to people because the government can't just do that. That's pretty simple. But your point is when it's coming to the complex issues, which we've been gridlocked on for 30, 40 years, I don't know if you had this feeling, but it's so frustrating going back and reading a policy book from like the 90s or the 2000s. And then basically other than the individual players, the exact same debates and the same exact issues are basically the same thing. 
Yeah, the same thing. And here's what's really, really interesting is that, quote, solution, again, will not be perfect in the minds of every person, but there are solutions that are broadly accepted out there, meaning a set of trade-offs that, let's say, you could pull and 60 to 70 percent of people say, I could live with that on, I'll, I'll just use your hot button issue. I, let's not be afraid to touch it on the abortion issue. And years ago, there was, that was sort of the stasis solution. But both sides, see, in this duopoly where there's only two, have realized that actually, if we solve some of these problems, quote unquote, reach a, reach a detente, mm -hmm. guess what? People who are single issue voters on that will no longer be motivated to turn out and to give money. In Think how primary. much revenue that's the key has thing. gone into the system by the fact that we are still fighting over some of these issues for two decades, where if we had just left them sort of settled in a way that didn't make everybody happy, but you know, then there wouldn't have been the money. Whereas basically both sides are saying, we can have everything we want if we keep fighting. And then the other side says, no, we can have everything we want if we keep fighting. And so it just puts more money into the political system, divides us further and further. And that means that in the duopoly, there's this perverse incentive where actually both sides are in many ways incented not to solve problems because it drives, keeping those problems alive drives revenue into the system. And it draw and it keeps your voters supportive of you, which is to say, what if we got rid, what if we quote unquote solved using this policy, uh, you know, sort of compromise that's been reasonably the same in all the papers you read since the 90s on immigration? Well, then that frees up voters for whom immigration has been their biggest issue to possibly choose a different party of the two because their next issue, they align more with that other party. Nobody wants to give up their voters the way they've cultivated them now because that could hurt them. So when you only have two, they like to keep things unsolved. It's just the way a marketplace works. Mm -hmm. No. So let's get to, in the last section here, the final five voting specifically that's going to basically culminate the rule changes that you're provide that you're articulating here. Great. So what I'm looking for to summarize in the solution that I, you know, sold my company to spend the rest of my life working on, um, is a solution that is powerful and is achievable. I don't want to recommend pie in the sky things, but but when I say powerful, I want to cover that again. I am saying, what can we do? that would use our election system to create the optimal conditions under which Congress is going to solve problems, which is to say, yes, the election chooses who wins, but what I'm looking for in the system is a system that chooses who wins, but most importantly, gets the winners into a position where they are free and powerful in addressing complex problems, okay? So final five voting is the combination of two changes. First, we get rid of party primaries because they forbid people from working together and they forbid them from dealing with trade-offs. And instead, we will have a primary, a single primary. So there is a first round election called the primary. Everybody shows up, everybody wants to shows up. Maybe it's still only 10% of people. And candidates are all running on the same ballot, Democrats, Republicans, Greens, Independents, Libertarians. You pick your favorite, the polls close, we count the votes, and the top five finishers out of the primary will advance to the general election. We're not going to have just one Republican and one Democrat. We'll have five candidates advancing. Now, between the primary and the general, we benefit from a dynamic debate of diverse ideas, candidacies, visions, policy innovations, because we've got five people bringing up new ideas, competition, putting it into the system. And then the second thing we do is in the general election, we now 
have to figure out of those five, who should win? And we can't stick with plurality voting where whoever gets the most votes wins, because now that we have five, what if the votes split five ways and and they all got about 20 percent and someone eked out the win with 21 percent? That wouldn't represent consent of the governed. Right. That wouldn't say that's the person who represents this general electorate. So what we do is now when you go to the polls, we're going to use a ranked choice ballot. You go in and you see the five choices and you do what we naturally do as humans. You're like, oh, my goodness, this person is my favorite. And you fill in the first choice bubble. I love them. I want them to be my senator. And then, okay, but if I can't have Marshall, you know, I'll take Amy. And so she's my second. And you go all the way down to your fifth choice, your last choice, which is something like over my dead body, do I want this person to be my senator? The voter can rank as many or as few as she wants. Then the polls close and all the first choice votes are counted. If one of those five has a true majority, over 50%, great, election is over, they win, they have the support. But if the vote is split and there is no clear choice with a majority, then we have a series of instant runoffs. The candidate who comes in fifth place, last place, is eliminated. And voters who had selected that candidate who's now out of the race have their single vote transferred to their next choice who is still in the race. Now we have four candidates left. We run the totals again. And if someone has a true majority, they win. If nobody does, then the person in last place, fourth place is eliminated. Voters who had selected that candidate again have their vote transferred to their next choice. And we continue that process until we know which of these five has the broadest support of the most number of voters. Now, that seems like a really, quote, fair and, you know, democratic way to choose a winner. But again, what we care about is the result that this system has on what the winner can now do. So think about it quickly. Now, when this winner is in Washington, D.C., they care about every voter in their district, not just people who voted in primaries, They care about people who aren't maybe even in their party because maybe they were those people's third choices, right? They're responsive to the general electorate and they know that if they don't get things done, they'll have new competition next time. They know they just can't be an incumbent and waltz back in all the time because they're protected in their Republican primary or their Democrat primary. They know that they actually have to get the job done or there'll be truth tellers in the election running against them. And so they now have, and they know that they won't automatically lose if they sign up, if they vote yes on a compromise, even if they disappoint the people that they agree with the most, like quote unquote, the base, let's say that we elect an exact same person right now. And they really are a, let's say we, you know, elect uh, someone who really is an AOC Democrat, for example, and they believe what, you know, her platform is, but they say to themselves, you know what, I'm not going to get that. So I'm going to vote yes on this solution that gets me some of what I propose. And maybe some of that, that, AOC Democrat supporters are disappointed, but they'll still choose that person as their second choice, which is to say the elected official can envision a path to winning re-election, which is to say to keeping their job that includes working with the other side, that includes not letting perfect be the enemy of the good, that includes not letting gridlock and keeping problems alive be better than solving a problem in a, quote, imperfect way in a diverse democracy. And those are the behaviors that we have got to have. Those are the behaviors that make all of us successful in our personal lives and our business lives. If we all got to let perfect be the enemy of the good, think where we would be. And that's- what that's, that's what Congress 
that's what our current election system allows everybody to do is keep saying, just vote for us, give us more money, and eventually we'll get perfect. And in the meantime, let's let it all go downhill. Final five voting ends that. And here's what I'll say. Final five voting does not guarantee that we will solve our most complex problems in Congress. It ends the guarantee that we will not. I think that's a, I, what I just love about this is summing up the issue of our system as our system's demand for perfection to address anything is just a good way of putting it. Um, so just for the last question, because you made reference to this, Alaska implemented what you're describing. Um, so basically for anyone who's skeptical about the, is this implementable? Will this make a difference? Let's just finish up with you. Just give me a quick articulation of how that came about and like whether you're, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping you're optimistic. That'd be a weird podcast if you weren't. You're, you're, you're likely optimism around uh, this issue moving forward in that given that reality. Marshall, I cannot believe that the Political innovation, this systemic change of final five voting, which I think is the most powerful thing that we can do, also happens to be in the scheme of things relatively achievable. How did we get that lucky? How is it that the thing that we need to do is, is more achievable than things that are less powerful, that we don't need a constitutional amendment for this? We're so lucky. Here's what happened in Alaska, and I'm so lucky about this. Um, I wrote on this issue for the, I published on this issue for the first time in 2017 and a, a report called Why Competition Politics is Failing uh, America. And a man named Scott Kendall, an Alaskan who had been involved at the highest levels in politics there, read it. And he saw this combination solution, um, which I now call final five voting as an answer to the challenges that Alaska is facing in their state government and with their federal delegation. And so he took action. He created a ballot initiative and ran that all the way to the finish line, which is to say in November, the citizens of Alaska got to vote. Yes, we want to change this system or no, we don't. And indeed the yes is one. So Alaska implemented what I would call final four voting, which is to say they have the top four vote getters advance instead of the five that I now yeah, why'd you choose? Why'd you, why'd you choose five? I should have asked. That's the obvious question. Oh, you know, um, I don't want to get too distracted on that, but uh, more competition is better until it becomes too much. And there's some game theory issues around odd numbers versus even numbers. And we want a yeah, low no enough need to, yeah, no need to get into the, yeah, thanks. Et cetera. So, so point being in 2017, I was recommending four. And now it has become clear that five is is a better you know number. But oh my God, I would take you know <laughs> final four voting every single day of my life. So Alaska implemented that. They've altered their incentives for both their state legislature and Congress, and they have all, and we get to see what they're doing there. This is the laboratories of democracy, and they have already formed a um, a caucus that is you know, comprised of Democrats, Republicans and independents in their state legislature who now have the freedom to say, how could we work together to solve these problems because they won't automatically lose their primaries. And that is um, really encouraging. And it also simply, candidly, it just, I always thought this was achievable, but it is now clear to me that a lot of people I was talking to didn't really think it was nearly as achievable as I did until they saw that Alaskans had achieved it. So that's put a lot of momentum behind this effort. And final five voting will be on the ballot in, my goal is that we will, that it will be on the ballot and that we will win in a minimum of four states in 2022, which is to say that four states plus Alaska would give us 10 senators who will likely still all be Democrats and Republicans. Maybe they will be an independent or something, but who now have the freedom to basically come off the bench as a gang of six or a gang of eight to break the partisan stalemate that we have now. And by the way, they'll still believe what they believe. I'm for ideology. I'm for passionate you know, opinions about issues and directions, et cetera. And then I'm for saying, now let's figure out what we do with what we believe in a democracy 
to move us forward. And so we would already see an altered political reality in Congress, even with only four, quote, only four more states adopting this. And we have bipartisan legislation in the state of Wisconsin uh, as a result of an organization that I co-founded in 2017. So the issue is moving forward across the country. It's unbelievably exciting. I would say to your listeners, if they want to get involved, I mean, that's really the point in the end. I mean, I hope people like the idea, yeah. but really that will only, it can't be, oh, I like it. I hope somebody does that. You know, it's more like, oh, I like it. And I should be a part of making that happen in my state. Um, because Article One of the Constitution says the states make these rules. So all the power is in the states, which means all the power is with those of us who live in those states to go for that change. So my, my website is political-innovation.org. And if people want to get involved, um, that's where I, I hope that they go. Great. Yeah. So for to wrap it, where should, so other than your website, is there anything people should go check out um, if they're interested in delving more into this topic? Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, I think people should forward your podcast to their friends. If someone listened to this and liked it, please share it. Um, another option to share is that I have a TED Talk that is 17 minutes. So it is designed to take people from never having heard of it to a pretty good comprehension of Final Five and the benefits of it in 17 minutes. And you can just, you know, go to TED.com and put my name in, Catherine Gale, G-E-H-L, and, and it'll come up. And then please share that with people because our biggest challenge right now is that when we get this in front of people, our, our adoption rate, our yes, I would want that is really high. You know, I would buy that. But we haven't gotten in front of enough people yet. So anybody who can help with getting this word out there is really important. And then and then the second thing is, if you want to then do something more than spreading the word to go to politicalinnovation.com, be in touch with us, and we can let you know if there's a campaign in your state that you could engage with to volunteer your time or treasure um, an influence to make a difference um, in your state or nationally as people would like. That's perfect. Catherine, thank you so much for joining. This is a really, really interesting topic. Obviously, a lot of people have interest in and I just love things that could focus on achievable solutions because too often it's a little too pie in the sky. And this is, whether you agree with it or not, this is the direction that people should be trying to move on whatever their policy interests actually align with. Yes, uh, it's totally nonpartisan. I say it's not a Trojan horse for either party's advantage. And that is somewhat, you know, unique out there. And it's what we need. And I have to say, I have loved your questions. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks.